Hi and welcome to our today's webinar. Um, I have here with me Pedro, Chris and Carlos from the server density team and we are going to speak about um, how we use Zookeeper, Kafka and Storm for processing alerts or processing payloads uh, to emit alerts in our monitoring uh, platform. Um, this uh, processing is key, is where all the magic happens and we are using these three technologies uh, we have mentioned. And that's what we are going to be speaking in the next um, half an hour, 40 minutes more or less. If you, don't, if you cannot stop looking at my t-shirt and this webinar gets too boring, you can go to our website and bet one of your friends um, to see who one uh, gets more text logos and you will be able to win one of these limited edition t-shirts. And well, I think we kind of start um, already with the webinar. Um, it's going to be Zookeeper, Kafka and Storm. But I think it would be a good idea to get a little bit of introduction, uh, get to know to the basis of these technologies. So. For example, let's just start with Zookeeper. What's um, Zookeeper? <clears throat> Basically, Zookeeper is a way to coordinate uh, a cluster of servers uh, on uh, having a service. So you don't need to care about who is uh, having the lock to write some data to coordinate uh, every single service that a member of, uh, of that cluster. Uh, so you have an API you are able to write there, and you don't care about uh, uh, the locking system, Suki is going to take care of that for you. Uh, so you, 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 you forget about all, all that complexity because it's uh, something that is well tested and mm -hmm. uh, working. And I guess here in Server Density, we are using uh, Zookeeper to coordinate all the services or the servers that uh, are part of this distrib distributed mm -hmm. environment. One of the things all the technologies we are using are just more uh, for 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 the for the alert processing, are just in Zookeeper as a way to coordinate between mm -hmm. uh, all all members of the cluster, and also internally we are using also to to <clears throat> to handle the the way we we activate some alerts or we disable those alerts in case we are doing some um, maintenance in the system and mm -hmm. we want to to trigger some kind of alerts instead of having to. To go one by one with service change the configuration, we use that central side of uh, uh, of data as a way to to automatically uh, deploy that for the whole cluster. I guess one of the the services that's used in Zookeeper it's Kafka. When I started to look at Kafka the first time, I went crazy with the different uh, um, names and a lot of ter terminology. Uh, around this uh, technology, Kafka. Can you tell us a little bit about what are the main components of a, Ka a Kafka system and what is um, Kafka useful for? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> Kafka basically is a kind of a queue where you put things and you extract mm -hmm. things to, to, to process. Uh, so it has a consumer, uh, which basically, oh, sorry, a producer first. Mm -hmm. Which is basically the way you put information into, into Kafka to, for processing. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have uh, then a consumer that goes there and just puts uh, okay. uh, the, the first thing you put on, uh, on the queue to be processed. Uh, <clears throat> and um, the way it handles that is uh, uh, to, to create different topics, which is kind of the, the, the queue names where uh, you're able to, to store different. Data sets on for 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 the different purposes, and and that's split it into partitions if you want to escalate the the, the service even more in the way that you are able to split that queue between more than one server. Uh, <clears throat> that means that uh, you split it into smaller pieces uh, across different servers, and each server has the um, responsibility for that concrete partition and nothing more from, from the whole queue. I understand that these servers, they are called brokers in 
in Kafka terminology, is that mm -hmm. correct? And what's exactly the, the, the relationship within, between the different brokers? Um, how they communicate, or is there any leader that's coordinating the rest? How does it work? Yeah, the, 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 the way it works is, uh, um, as I said, uh, we have the partition set with a uh, different set of partitions uh, uh, fulfill uh, what is a, to uh, a topic. Uh, uh, what they do is um, you, your cluster is splitting that, that those partitions and elects one leader um, within the within the cluster, mm -hmm. and that leader is the is the one that takes uh, uh, the control for that uh, small part of the, of the queue. Um, you are able to to decide how um, high availability availability do you want to give to the to the data, uh, saying okay, I want to. Have this uh, queue replicated between two, three, four, and servers. You, you decide to do that, and uh, and and then um, in case that one of those servers go down and they are the leader for that partition, uh, all data is replicated already in the other server, so they mm -hmm. right away are able to take over the the leadership of that. Okay. Of the partition and take over the service automatically as everything is held by the protocol. Okay, so we, we we have seen that we use Zookeeper to organize all these guys uh, working together with different um, services. We have Kafka handling the queuing of the bucket, uh, the payloads that they arrive to the server density. Uh, I think we will go later on more in the details. And the third technology that it's supporting this uh, whole um, payload processing is the storm. Uh, what is the storm exactly doing for us here in server density? How are we using the storm? Oh, how they do it. Apache Storm is, um, is a system we are uh, having, uh, well, we are using to handle all the all those uh, stream of data we are getting all inside Kafka. So basically, uh, a storm is the one, the, the consumer we're using for Kafka, goes to Kafka, extracts the data, and then uh, it goes over different steps doing processing the data and getting the results. Uh, <clears throat> a storm is a, is a, um, has a, something we, that they call uh, spouts. And, and bolts. It's about bolts, yeah. yeah. Like in Kafka, they they are quite funny with the names <laughs> as well, yeah. Yeah, kind of. Uh, so basically, the spout is uh, what uh, injects the data into the system for processing the Apache Storm, mm -hmm. which in our case is uh, we're using a, a spout for for Kafka. It's, its only task is go to Kafka and get the next uh, uh, data. Um, yeah, get the next data package and inject it into the system. Uh, from there on, uh, we go to a set of different bots which uh, uh, create what is uh, called a topology, uh, which is uh, um, the, what describes all the all the steps we are going to follow mm -hmm. from the beginning of uh, when we get the, the, the raw package and we uh, deliver, uh, in our case, an alert or just the storage of the network. Okay, so, so all these path that, the, in our case, the payloads follow between the different uh, spots and bolts in, in, in the storm. It's, I think it's called topology. Is that correct? Yeah, it's correct. Okay, okay, very good, very good. Um, so we have seen these three technologies, again, so Keeper, Kafka, and Storm. And we mentioned before that we use them for payload processing. But can you tell us a little bit more what's the process that payloads that the servers that we are monitoring send? Uh, what's the process that these payloads uh, follow once they arrive from the servers that we monitor into server density network? And what happens there? What's that magic that we, we said before that's happening? So. Um Basically, um, when, when we, we get from, from the item we have our, our installed on, uh, that all of our customers have installed on their servers, uh, they send us the, 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 the payload into entries into the system. And uh, it goes through the load balancer, which is based on the engines. 
uh, servers. And from there, it goes straight away to a Tomato uh, server, which is going to do basic validations just to be sure that uh, it, it was not corrupted on or when it was traveling over the internet into mm -hmm. our system. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, um, well, if all the validations are passed, we store it into, into Kafka. We, mm -hmm. we, we go to Kafka, and depending on the, on the, on the customer, it's stored in a, in, a, in a different partition for, okay. for, for the payload queue. Mm -hmm. So in this case, Tornado, uh, we can say it's a producer. For the Kafka. Yeah, in this case, it's the producer okay. we are using Kafka. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what's happening? After that, uh, then um, this is the, the, the synchronous part of the, of, of the acceptance of the payload for, from the agent. Mm -hmm. From that point on, um, we install that in Kafka, and it may be uh, a couple of milliseconds before a uh, storm pulls from, from it. But uh, the agent is already done and is able to disconnect from our server and it doesn't need to, to, to do anything else uh, uh, other than just wait for the next minute and send another package. Uh, then the strong, the, the strong spot uh, connects to Kafka and says, give me the next package, uh, get that. And then we do more deep uh, testing on validations and we verify that the account is active we verify everything that uh, is okay so we can go uh, go uh, continue with the, with the processing uh, we have to to pass here in the processing one is for uh, updating the metrics which is uh, what we generate for the, the source of the data for generating all the graphs on the website and the other path which is for the alerts depending on the values we get <clears throat> we decide whether we need to trigger an alert, mm -hmm. or we need to close an open alert, or we just ignore it because everything is okay. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's uh, done uh, passing through uh, its vault. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the different steps we have is uh, the first one is uh, to enrich the, the, the data we want from outside, based on the metadata we have on our database for that customer and that server. Mm -hmm. um, the next step is to uh, we prepare the payload. Uh, we do some processing, well, some extra processing to prepare it in a way that is better, is easy, is more easy for us to 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 do the the alert checking mm -hmm. based on on what the customer has defined for this de device or the group of devices uh, where this device belongs. Um, and also uh, to prepare um, to prepare the data a format that we are going to store into into our database. Is that um, so? We don't store it exactly the same way we receive it. Mm -hmm. We just do some processing for that. Yeah. Okay. And so then the, well, the, the final stage is that if any alert is triggered, then we need to send the notification. So we have a separate bolt at that point too. So it's decided that it's triggered, somebody needs to know, we send a message to the, the final bolt that sends a notification out, and then that's the email, SMS that you get. So if I understood this uh, properly, uh, the payloads, uh, they arrive to server density, they are stored in, in Kafka, who handles all this key, and then the agent forgets uh, or waits until the next time needs to report, send us a payload. Uh, the storm needs to pick up these payloads or packages from the queue and puts them through this topology that I, I understand is like kind of going to a shopping mall that you, uh, where you need to stop in different little shops and we do different things mm -hmm. like adding information on th things that we were in the database and, and things that we don't have in the payload as it was uh, received. Um, so this is uh, the system that we, we, we have here in server density. Um, what kind of issues uh, did you find while you were preparing the system to be brought into production? What was the, the tricky part of all this? What issues did you uh, find difficult to, to polish before bringing all this up into production? I, I had a stupid one that you couldn't delete topics. 
<laughs> so yeah, when we were testing, we were, ended up creating topics with with different names, and then we couldn't delete them without getting rid of it all. I think they fixed that now. Yeah, and that's the, now the latest version. Uh, yeah, you need to activate that. But uh, the latest version, yeah. you so to remove it. Be careful what you name your topics. Yeah, that, that, that's a problem. In, you know, that was a problem in in the storm. No. Uh, it, it was Kafka. Oh, it was Kafka. Yeah, uh, it was an interesting thing that they've done all this fantastic work, but then you couldn't get rid of it, which is <laughs> lovely. Okay. Well, that's, uh, what we what we did with in the testing phase is just uh, drop all the information and it's okay. But we, <laughs> we got to do that in production, so uh, it's nice that they, they fix it up. So in production, you are able to remove topics. Uh, okay. Uh, you do uh, and mistake. Um, yeah, and another thing is just. Uh, we, we had a problem with the store because we didn't have enough experience at the time we started with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we we come from uh, from other, from Solary, which works in a different way. And we were uh, trying to uh, attach it to as uh, what all the code we, we had before. Mm -hmm. So we didn't try. We oh, we didn't want to change much. Well, that's worth pointing out. We don't use Java to do our, our processing. Oh, yeah. We moved from Celery and we had Python. Everything's written in Python. And one of the flexibility and nice features of Storm is you're able to call outside processes. So it's got multi-language support. Basically, if you can fire it up and it can listen on a port, then Storm can use it. So we were able to export all our Python code and uh, Celery tasks pretty much into bolts into Storm, so it's kind of a one for one. Um, and that, so the, the only Java that exists is the topology design that, that generates the, the topology Java that's deployed. The rest of it is discrete Python. And one of the problems I had when I was, when I was, was writing it as well was that it was very difficult to run a, a packet um, and anything all the way through and end to end and it would fail and you wouldn't know where. But one of the things we, because we were writing individual Python scripts, we were able to get um, something that was potentially problematic. We would see that it would fail at one particular point, then we could isolate and run that bolt on its own just by typing its name into the command line and being able to pass the data into it. So that was um, being able to debug in a timely manner initially was quite complicated because we had to sort of find out where it went wrong in the topology. But once we were able to isolate it out, it also meant unit testing was so much easier. Each bolt was completely self-contained. So once the, once the you could mock out the um, basic uh, storm bits, and then you just had ordinary Python. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another problem we had uh, well, that was really more an advantage when we took care of our, how it was working, but uh, it also had a downside uh, that. Uh, Apache Storm is uh, it warranties you that uh, all your all, all the information is going to process is going to be processed for sure. If it's not being processed because something happened in the vault and it failed for some reason, uh, it's going to try again until it's uh, completed. Okay. Uh, the problem we had is that uh, to do that by the fourth uh, Storm expects that uh, any single package is going to be processed in less than uh, 30 seconds, uh, which is a lot, because in our case, we are processing uh, uh, every single um, data package we are processing is taking, takes around 150 milliseconds. Uh, so th the, the problem is that we, we were injecting a lot of data, and we have some uh, misunderstanding on the way the storm is working. So uh, we had some external calls uh, over HTTP uh, protocol uh, without a timeout set, which is the first uh, big mistake. And for some reason, uh, it was taking more than what we expected to complete. And then it produced a really <laughs> a storm of packages <laughs> because uh, the queue was being installed and then most of the packages were taking more than 30 seconds to be completed. So uh, Apache Store was trying that, but we were keeping uh, getting the flow of uh, information from the outside. Uh, so the, the ball was start growing, growing, growing. And 
and the, 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 the deaths were, were completely broken. Uh, everything was okay for a small number of packages, but when we started uh, injecting, um, testing, testing load similar to what we have in production, it was a complete disaster. And that was four months after <laughs> I started working on the, on the project. So we were at a point where uh, it was not a, a Reverting to or changing to something else was not uh, an option. Uh, hopefully, uh, the things are, it's a matter of uh, just uh, investigating a bit more uh, all the settings we have in the store and detecting those those uh, mm, those uh, calls missing the, the timeout and fixing it either speeding it up or uh, doing it more uh, less less uh, strict on the mm -hmm. on on them. Uh, completing completely the task, or just well, we, we rewrite the code and we, we figure a way to to to, to solve that problem. I, so I, everything I, in the system now has a, a really low timeout and proper uh, error handling in that in those cases. I have to believe that timeout was probably one of the biggest issue you you faced uh, when when trying to deploy um, this setup. So. You, would be your main recommendation to say take into account all the timeouts so you don't yeah. reach into situation where you have a starvation or you have like piling up payloads. Well, so. Basically, basically the thing is uh, you are able to uh, on on your development testing you are able to to measure how how long it's going to take the, the full process you have, uh, but you need to take in account a lot any external call you do mm -hmm. because and the laboratory is going to work perfectly but when you start getting more low and you start getting some network problems mm -hmm. unexpected network problems and things like that mm -hmm. uh, that's going to affect a lot mm -hmm. uh, so even if even if if you put a timeout you should be able to handle the failure of the, this timeout is going to to expire and and you should be able to handle that in a way uh, that you recover from the situation and so, so after all these testing, and um, we we were happy enough, and we decided to bring the system into production. Uh, and I guess this is now a question more for for Pedro. Uh, what kind of uh, deployment or setup we have taken into production, and what kind of hardware does it run on top of? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the first principle is that we. We run everything in high availability, mm -hmm. and so we replicate quite a lot of hardware. So, and we prepare for at least a failure in every single system. Okay. So, starting with the load balancers that uh, were mentioned before, uh, we duplicate those, um, and that's where all the pellets come in, and then they are delivered um, to Tornado. And in our case, we run Tornado on the storm cluster. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, the storm cluster runs the um, all the storm um, <clears throat> bolts and spouts and also runs a tornado. Mm -hmm. And each of um, we have we have um, uh, at the moment uh, five storm servers. Okay. Um, and we each one is a dedicated server with the uh, Eight, eight cores and eight gigabytes of memory. Mm -hmm. um, we run five because uh, of what I just mentioned, is that we can process everything with four, so we must prepare to, to do maintenance on one, or if one fails, we, we will still be able to, to cope with the workload. So this is a storm cluster, mm -hmm. and uh, Zookeeper and Kafka, we run it on another cluster, okay. uh, but it has a much, it has um, a much lower capacity because its load is also is also lower. So we run uh, we run um, this cluster, the Zookeeper and Kafka, on a three machine cluster mm -hmm. uh, because we can uh, it, it can process our workload with just two. And in this in this case, uh, this cluster is virtual machines with two CPUs and two gigabytes of memory mm -hmm. each. Um, and um, yeah, and to and to our enough for our workload. What you would say is the the bottleneck, both in 
in um, a store and then in Kafka and Zookeeper. It's CPU, it's uh, a storage input output. In speed. store, it's CPU uh, mm -hmm. because all of the processing that was mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, in uh, Zookeeper and uh, under Zookeeper and Kafka, it's probably memory. Nice. It's, it's memory. I, uh, I guess it's because uh, Zookeeper and Kafka they run all this mapping in memory, all the data is in memory. So. We need to have a lot but it's of not memory. very very demanding. So, like I said, each each of the servers is mm -hmm. two gigabytes of memory. Mm -hmm. uh, and once we we put this into production, I guess we we also started to monitor all these systems. Yeah, yes. What yeah. kind of metrics are key for us? And so actually, we started developing them. Well, not developing, but we started to set up the monitoring while we were still in in mm -hmm. testing. Uh, there's we, we monitor quite a lot of, of this uh, of the entire system, but there's a couple of, of key points. Like for example, um, knowing if there's uh, if there are um, under replicated partitions, mm -hmm. that means that the zookeeper and the Kafka cluster has some kind of issue. Either a member uh, has fallen out of the cluster or uh, it had a problem on one of its members, mm -hmm. so that's one of the um, <clears throat> one of the metrics we monitor. Um, we also monitor the number of followers mm -hmm. on on that cluster because it has a leader and should always have two followers. If it, if it has less than two followers, uh, it's there's a problem somewhere. And and then on on the storm um, on the storm cluster, uh, we monitor. Um, the time that it takes to process mm -hmm. uh, each of the each each of the of the, of the bolts that we that we bolt run time, so yeah. we know exactly how long any bolt process mm -hmm. on each mm -hmm. one, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And for that, we actually integrate with uh, with Statsy, so we report we report it yep, the, that that timing, and then we we use a Statsy plugin to plot that on server density and alert on it and. Mm -hmm. So we have very detailed metrics of every little step yeah. the payloads they as they go through this topology. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's a, that was a requirement as of the development time to be able to to, to detect where where we where we were studying or where we fighting too much time for for the processing. As, as well as the time, we also uh, monitor the number uh, account on each bolt. So we know if um, how many are successful and how many fail. So if the error rate starts to go up, yeah, the error rate is also another important important mm -hmm. item to monitor, which should do. When I think one um, peculiarity of of our platform is that we have some kind of sustained load. This is not like a website, for example, when you have a big storm of visits and then you might have a valley. Um, as we have servers that they are connected all the time and they are reporting metrics all the time, uh, more or less our load slightly increases or slightly decreases, but it's more or less uh, aligned with the number of, of customers that we're using our platform. Exactly. Um, do you think this is uh, something uh, very particular of us? Are you using this for alerting in a yes, different it's, way? It's particular and we use it for, for alerting actually. So if it drops uh, or if it increases, if those values drop or increases in uh, outside a certain ma margin that we set, it means that something is wrong. So either we are processing less than we should mm -hmm. or we are probably getting something additional that we don't know what it is and needs to be investigated. Or if we're taking longer. So yeah. if suddenly things are taking a half a second longer or one millisecond, then we can track down what it is and we can tell pretty instantly which part, which component it is. Uh, so I think we are very we're quite lucky that our low uh, workload is pretty much like a factory. Uh, one after each other, and, yeah. and so we don't experience high peaks or or deep valleys here. Yeah. Um, you have mentioned like uh, while we were working on this new design, you already started the monitoring. Do we also have some kind of a staging environment where we test uh, things? How does it differ from the production environment? It's exactly the same, but smaller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. 
that's the cheapest we can get away with it, basically. <laughs> so basically, we use the exact same, so we uh, we use the exact same codes to deploy staging and mm -hmm. production. Okay. Uh, not only the code that we run, but the code that describes our infrastructure. So we use it. We yeah. use the, exactly the same code. I guess we are using some automation software. Yes, yeah, so we, yeah. uh, we, use, we use Puppet for configuration management, and we use exactly the same code mm -hmm. for each environment. So the only difference really is the size of machines and the number of machines. So for example, in staging, we only have a cluster of three uh, for store, mm -hmm. um, and much smaller machines, so VMs. And okay. Mm, what you would say is the procedure um, for, maintain, for maintaining these clusters that we have in production, what kind of procedures do you follow if you need to either deploy new code or you need to upgrade the machines? Are these different or how yes, they are? are. Uh, so, <clears throat> if we need to, to update the servers, which happens at least once a month, mm -hmm. um, and it, uh, so once a month is uh, we have it scheduled, and if there's any major security update, we apply it immediately. And the way we do it is that we, since we are, we have it deployed and in N plus one, mm -hmm. uh, N plus one scenario, we can always take, take out one node of the cluster, do whatever we want with it and put it back in. So that's, that's how we do the, um, the operating system. system, the operating system updates, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys want to talk about how do we deploy? The actual code. Well, you, you take this one. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, for, for for the deployment, uh, what we are uh, using is uh, uh, you. Well, we are we are running uh, the topology in the store, as we as we said. Uh, so the first step is uh, we deploy it with Puppet, and uh, then it uh, it's, uh, it it spreads the the code across the full cluster, and after that. Uh, we we use the storm tools to handle the topology. Basically, the first step is that we say uh, we are going to kill this topology. Killing a topology doesn't mean that it's going to stop everything right away. It's just that uh, it uh, it's drains. Not, yeah, it drains, it drains, drains yeah. the topology. So basically, it stops within from Kafka, but whatever is in the system keeps keeps going on and keeps being processed until everything is done. When everything is done, or uh, a timeout of 30 seconds, uh, uh, it's uh, ends, uh, then the topology dies completely. What we do is the first thing is we we, we kill the topology, we we drain it, and at the same time it's, drain, it's being drained, uh, we run the new topology with a new code, uh, in a way that uh, this new topology with a new code is. Uh, keeping care of uh, the new of, of the new packages we are getting to be processed, so we don't interrupt the, the processing uh, at any time, and and we are we are able to uh, be completely sure that uh, we don't lose any packages just because we killed something that is being and, and being processed right, uh, at that point. It is it's worth noting with Storm you can run multiple topologies. On the same cluster. So if we decide that we want to move anything else to Storm, we can just create a new topology and just run it in the existing cluster, and um, you know, that will work fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's giving us at least a big picture uh, of how um, we run all these three technologies. Um, before going to uh, into our um, viewers' questions. I'd like to ask you, why did you finally decide for um, Zookeeper, Kafka, Storm? Uh, did you consider any other options? What made you decide for for Storm and Kafka? We, we, we were using Celery, and we'd looked at other things before we chose Celery, and Celery, it was proving to be a bit too much of a black box. Um, I know a lot of people do run successful things on large scales with it, but we were just were not getting, for the amount of effort that we were putting in to maintain it and to develop it, we weren't getting back what we needed from it. Uh, we looked, at, well, I looked at a few different things, we looked at 0MQ, uh, RabbitMQ and these sort of things. 0MQ 
there's a funny one, and the way the one thing that put me off is it's possible to lose messages, at least my understanding of the documentation. When you when you're a subscriber and you talk to a publisher, he starts pushing stuff at you, and if you're not ready, you do lose stuff. So that we couldn't afford to be losing anything, especially not by design. Uh, it the the whole the stack itself, Storm Kafka and Zuki, was just sort of came as one, and it. If you choose Storm, then the, it, it, there was a bit of a toss-up between that and Kestrel, I think, Kestrel or Kafka. But Kestrel, and I think Starling was a Twitter one, and they sort of died of death, and the one that st stuck around is Kafka. And that was just sort of, a, um, it came all together. Uh, the, the real big attraction of it, of Storm, was the ability to be able to just scale. We've got, at the moment, we're quite comfortable with on the hardware that we're running, but we can just scale horizontally to, and run as many processes as we need without any problems, really. Well, we've certainly not met any problems scaling with it yet. And what are the future plans uh, as we are going towards, uh, thanks to this deploy? What do you think it's going to bring to, to server density, uh, this uh, technology of payload processing? Infinite scaling. <laughs> <laughs> The, the, the most, the most uh, important thing that we uh, are, the, the biggest thing for, for this is that we, we want to at some point uh, increase uh, the frequency we are going to process packages. Uh, so right now we're processing every minute. Uh, so at some point uh, we're preparing the system to, to be able to, to have it uh, every 10 seconds, something like that. Uh, that's that's uh, increasing the, the load a lot. So that's going to be a really good way to 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 test the, this, the only, the, that that our escalation that our store is going to provide mm -hmm. for us. So in theory, it should be just a matter of adding more nodes to the cluster, um, mm -hmm. and basically that, that that that's it. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, if you don't have anything else uh, that you wanted to bring to the table today, I think we can uh, move into our viewers' uh, questions. Um, I have here a few that they are sending us through Hangouts on there. Um, most bold one is, would you infrastructure be suitable for customer-facing functionality? For example, a high number of concurrent queries with a low latency? Uh, no, I, I, no, we were more sort of specialised in data backend data processing. So I, I probably wouldn't involve anything with the UI that requires. Yeah, I don't know. Also, the the discrete the bolts are discrete elements, so there isn't the idea of state. So I think even just getting the message back to the UI would be a problem. Mm -hmm. But it, it's really more designed for sort of backend data processing rather than from yeah, yeah. Even, even even if it's being um, quite fast, or, or, and you try to, to process everything really, really fast. It's hard to 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 connect that and to feedback in real time mm -hmm. on, the, on our website. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's designed for that. Okay. Well, at least our experience has been using mm -hmm. this in the back end. Um, we have a, another question, uh, which is: What do you use to move data records uh, from the source systems? Into um, sorry, I lost the question. So, what do you yeah, what do you use to move data records from the source systems into Kafka topics? Uh, do you have any recommendations for this? We use Fluent D agents for the same. Have you given them a try? So, is that so actually the, how to move data or records from the source systems into Kafka? I guess so. Is that so the the producer? Mm -hmm. Um, we there was a standard Python library that seemed to be because we we use Tornado uh, um, and the one the the old friend feed one and there's a Python library that just fitted into that. Um, Scapes, I don't know what it was called. Oh, I don't remember either. I think we mentioned the blog post. Yeah, right. Uh, the, there's a blog post in the description of this uh, of this webinar. Uh, there we are describing all the levers we are using for for this system. Mm -hmm. I, I, the the fact we can't remember what it's called shows how good it is. It it sits there, <laughs> it talks to Kafka, and it just does the right thing. I mean, it's doing the most simple thing. Uh, Tornado is a massively asynchronous web server. The the message comes in, 
it wraps it up, it sends it to Kafka, and job done. It's, uh, it, and yeah. I guess on the other part, we are using a standard HTTPS connection for uh, sending the tables from the server. Yeah, we've done everything over HTTP, HTTPS, depending on where we are. Yeah. So everything's done over, over a normal web interface. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Um, one of the other questions is, um, what process did you suggest to back up Kafka cluster for a point in time recovery? Um, how do we do that in production? Um, so we assume that we never lose that data. Mm -hmm. That's why we replicate, uh, replicate those, the, those servers, mm -hmm. and that's why we have uh, we have that uh, that cluster distributed. Mm -hmm. So uh, unless something uh, very big happens, uh, we will never lose that data. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the thing is, for for in our case, uh, our data uh, gets old really really fast, really really fast way. Uh, so we is it, we are not using Kafka to as a long term storage. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, we in fact we are only uh, we only keep on Kafka the last. 10 minutes of information because uh, as soon as it's, uh, it's introduced into Kafka, uh, we extract it and we process it. We cannot delay that because that means that if you have a problem with your server and we take uh, too long to, to start processing your package, uh, you will not notice the, the problem. You will not get the alert in time. And uh, maybe an alert which is important now, uh, you get it five minutes later, mm -hmm. it's too late, and all your system is completely broken. Well, so, so I guess for us, it doesn't have any sense to back up the data, which is quite we, we need, we need high and recover it in the future. Yeah, we need a high availability of the data. Uh, that's why we have it uh, replicated uh, across the cluster completely, even if we don't need that. But we do that, so we have durability for, for the data but only for those last 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I, I was reading up on replication before this. Um, it, you have the leader and you have followers, and then the leader dies, goes to the next follower. It chooses them by keeping a internal record of in-sync repli in replicas. The data in Kafka is not committed until a certain number of people um, agree that it's committed. So your leader will have it committed, and your two backups will say it's committed. If your leader fails, it, it maintains this list and it knows which one's going to be next so that one of these guys will, will take over. Uh, from what I was reading, uh, if you keep, if you lose everything, you, you start one up and hope it recovers. And then it, it's not so much a point in time, it's the last point mm -hmm. that it died. Mm -hmm. So it'll come back from there. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, we have another question. This is going to be an easy one. Um, can you help us to know which versions of Kafka so Keeper and Storm are you using in production? Latest. Yeah. <laughs> so when uh, when we started, like I said before, we we upgraded at least once a month. When we started, we were on the latest. Uh, we are not exactly on the latest now, but we'll be in the in some days. Mm -hmm. Are we a point behind on Storm or something? Like yeah, that's not nothing. Yeah. So we should always be on the latest. <laughs> The other question I have here is, um, do you follow Lambda, so real-time class batch approach, or does same Kafka store pipeline transform and load the data to the data store? Well, I think that's a long question. Let me <laughs> um, say it again. If we follow our Lambda approach, which is doing real-time class batch uh, approach, or um, or and uh, if Kafka and Storm transform uh, the data and we put it in the uh, in the data store at the same time. So I think this was mentioned a little bit on different uh, Storm um, process, but uh, maybe you can. It, it's a little bit different for us because the the data that we're processing is a snapshot on your server at that moment that you sent it to us. So as long as we maintain that at that time you sent it to us, that's what we do. So we, we're not we're not real time, real time, but we're kind of like real time, but processing old data. We process it as fast as we can, but we're not real time because the data is not real time anymore because it's it's a snapshot. The important thing is that we cannot fall behind, otherwise yeah. the data starts to pass. Yeah, if, if we are not able to process it. The, the payload number one, 
would you send us the pill of number two? We have 12. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, we, 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 we have the system um, working in, in a way that we are completely sure that all the packages are being processed far uh, away from uh, before the, the, the next one comes. So, so even, so even if, the, if, if, if we are not uh, exactly a real time. Um, well, you have, you have the, the thing is, you have to the delays. The thing is, you have to the delays from uh, the agent collects the data from your server, and then that's taking a couple of milliseconds or maybe even some seconds mm -hmm. to prepare the, the JSON uh, pebble and send it back to us. Uh, so that's already adding some, some latency in the process. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's why it's delaying the, 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 the real time. Yeah. You put it, we put it into, into Kafka, that's also some small delay, and we get it back from Kafka to process it later. Mm -hmm. So it's not exactly real time, mm -hmm. okay. but we, we, we aim for I mean, it's probably, yeah, it's to, yeah, I mean, I would say the vast majority of cases it's probably less than five seconds yeah. you know, from the agent running Absolutely. and doing everything and passing it to us mm -hmm. and we'll process it and you'll see it live on the graph. <laughs> as, the, the thing is, as soon as we get a, a, a payload from Kafka into a store, it takes uh, 150 milliseconds to complete. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's the SLA we're trying to achieve with, uh, with the storm, uh, but that's not counting all the delays from the agent coming into our data center, um, from the our data center going into Kafka, and the small delay that we may introduce, just because we don't have a, uh, a specific queue uh, dedicated only for each server, uh, because that's that's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, I have here another question. Um, if you redo the technology stack today, would you still be picking the same technologies, Kafka and Storm? Yeah, I quite like the look of Spark. I, I, I was playing a bit, a little bit with that, and that that looks good. But we're happy with with um, Storm and Kafka. I mean, Kafka seems to be getting more popular. So does Storm. Um, works well with Python, and it's made unit testing a lot easier as well. So, yeah, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose the only—I mean, the only thing is it does require sort of more hardware than possibly it needs right now, but we are future-proof for it. So the payoff may be not be you know, immediate, but you're there being able to scale upwards. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, being Java. Um, this is a, another question that I have here is. Does the storm do any database queries to enrich the data? Ah, yes. Yeah, that, that's one of the one of the sources of information we get. We are just MongoDB um, um, for for the database. Mm -hmm. So um, we do several queries to Mongo as part of the process uh, of the group process. But it's not done asynchronously because the 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 way to think of bolts is uh, like pipes on Unix. So you you run. 50 processes, each one will deal with something that comes in. So it's fine for that one to be locked going off and talking to Mongo and coming back because it's not doing anything parallel. It's its own process. In fact, if you run, um, we run Linux, if you run PS-EF, you can see Python script name running. And that's the, so it can do whatever it wants. It can go off to Mongo, it can go off to date and do these things. We, um, our main uh, APIs are all web, uh, effectively RESTful services. So we do database calls directly, and we also do calls to other services, which is where the uh, weight problem that came yeah. up for you found out. <laughs> Very good. Um, and I'm going here with um, with the last question. Um, did you face any network uh, bottlenecks uh, when there is data movement between the worker processes running on different servers? Um, did you uh, or do you have any trick to optimize? Uh, this exactly point. Just refresh my memory. They all run on the same box, don't they? I think that's how we got around the network latency. That we just run all the work. The a topology runs on a box, so we have all the workers running. So that's how we don't have any network latency. No, actually, they run on the different ah. boxes of the cluster. <laughs> but the network latency is so low that you don't uh, you don't actually tell it. There was one issue though during our testing. So we started our testing with virtual machines. And our our provider of uh, of, uh, of servers um, 
that does deliver uh, 100 megabit interfaces by default. So one of the things that we found out is that we hit the 100 megabit uh, quite soon, and uh, we really had to update that to, to upgrade that to 1 gigabit ports. So, uh, and that we could tell on, on the, when, when the load started to increase. That was something that we did because we were moving quite, quite a number of data. Uh, all the machines are all in the same data center. I mean, I suppose they're physically located. Well, that's, that's, that's really not completely. We have uh, the, the, the Superkeeper cluster is split into two different data centers. But uh, uh, we try to do it uh, different, different combinations of the data center that our provider uh, gives us. And um, we had a problem with that, with the latency, exactly, because uh, I think it was uh, 20 or 30 milliseconds away. Yes, so uh, first... And we thought it would be good enough. Yes, so we actually we always, uh, currently we have it deployed on two different data centers of the same region. Mm -hmm. So that uh, uh, the same cluster is not affected by, by the same event but it may, may get affected by a regional event. Uh, what we tried to do before was uh, uh, having the cluster deployed across two, uh, two different regions, and these two regions were 20 milliseconds apart, and that was too much. So we couldn't we can't yeah, do think that. The problem is not with the storm itself, but the problem comes with Zookeeper, because Zookeeper wasn't able to, to, to keep the replication of the data uh, at the rate we are uh, requiring to, to work, uh, and given that the Storm and Kafka are coordinating with Zookeeper, uh, the, on our testing environment it was just uh, doing no sense, and uh, something stopped breaking, and uh, we were not completely sure until we uh, take a look to, taking a look to, to the, to the Zookeeper monitoring session, we saw that, we saw that uh, uh, the latency was starting to grow a lot, and then, uh, Yes, yeah. so three milliseconds is okay, 20 milliseconds yeah, is not. Yeah. And gigabyte ports. And, and yeah. gigabyte well, ports. Well, the gigabyte ports is for us because the, the, yeah. the size of the data we are using uh, more than, I think, the we, process, we process a lot of, of payloads, yeah. I guess. Well, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Uh, thanks very much uh, for your time today. It's been very interesting uh, to learn more about how uh, server density runs uh, so deeper cut kind of storm. Uh, we will be publishing more of these stories, webinars, uh, blog posts on the different technologies we use or how to monitor different technologies. So if you like this webinar, um, I think it's a good idea to follow our blog for similar content and hopefully we can continue with more webinars like this very soon. Um, thanks very much for uh, being um, this webinar today, and hopefully see you again in the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.